Spanish, you know? So at the beginning of the, of the, of the crisis, United States was defined as, an, as the, one of the nation best prepared, number one prepared uh, to deal with the pandemic. And however, we have been one of the worst in dealing with the pandemic, in part because we didn't take in consideration that despite all the infrastructure that we have, there is at the base inequality in access to healthcare. Uh, so it was not new for us, those who do research in, in race, to understand why the, the pandemic was, attack, was uh, attacking, what we say, communities of color and poor communities in particular. You know, we knew that just by where you're located in the Detroit region, your life expectancy drop for seven to eight years. So if you live in Detroit versus during the suburbia, uh, there is a huge disparity of the uh, quality of life that you have. And therefore the pandemic has worked in this kind of field. So that's how we understand racism, you know, how we have been talking in the nation. Um, at the same time, the same term color means something a little bit different in design and in aesthetic architecture. We, we think about it in terms of chromatics um, and how, that, how do we perceive color. Uh, we go into all these uh, theories about what, what is complementing, it defines theories in art and history. You know? So it looked like from the outside that even though we use the same word, they mean two very different things. So what I was interested in, for this lecture, it was to try to understand what is this kind of connection who is embedded in the way that we talk about in design, about color, who is intrinsically connected with our notions of race. Okay, so hopefully this thing will come across as we, as we do the lecture today. Okay, so this kind of intersection between these two areas is the one that I was trying to talk a little bit about. So uh, one of the first things that we have is this notion of, and I, because I'm working this kind of field of Latino studies, I was very interested in, in this particular quote that he said that it was a Spanish that who gave, who gave the world the notion that an aristocrat blood is not red but blue. Sangre azul, blue blood, was through an euphemism for being a white man. It's paying on particular reminder the refined footsteps of the aristocracy through history carried the rather less refined spur of racism. Uh, for, uh, we for, I forget to mention that I was born in Costa Rica and my family migrated to the United States um, several decades ago. They live in Phoenix, Arizona. So uh, talking about migration and talking about race is a central component of who I am as a person because I'm myself an immigrant. Uh, most of the time when I speak is when people recognize that I am, um, that I was not born in the United States. Um, and there is all these connotations about uh, how do we read race through uh, my features, the way that I talk, the intonation. Uh, so even the discourses that we have about race in the United States, and you know, when I teach race in the United States, I'm always going to say, okay, we, we are in a very unique space because we have uh, a tradition that comes from the England uh, history, and we have another tradition that comes from Spain, and, and then and France. And we need to talk about all these three in order to understand how do we get to the place that we are today. Okay, so color, even the discussion about color that is red, but as something that is blue, it carry on this kind of notion of differentiation between individuals. Okay, and we still use those things today. Uh, one of the things that I was very interested in, it was, for example, in how do we teach design and especially art theory. And one of the earliest books that we have in design about color, uh, it's by Gottlieb, and he say, and it's a very interesting because it's come from his own experience as a German man in relation with the rest of, of the European community, you know. Uh, he is spent a, a, a period of time in Italy. Uh, one of his famous books it had to do with that period. Uh, and in his book called Theory of Color for 1810, he said, men in a stage of nature, uncivilized nations, and children have a great outlet for colors in their almore brightness. 
Now, of course, we need to contextualize this particular male uh, German interpretation of color with their own relationship that Germany have with all the nations in, in Europe, especially Portugal, Spain, and Italy. And when he is talking about this kind of uncivilized nation, he is really referring to those nations closer to the Mediterranean. Okay, so we we need to start building a genealogy of how the West and how design has built this notion of relationship between color preferences that is tied, for example, in this case, to a notion of human who are in a state of nature. What does they mean with state of nature? He's really referring to uncivilized. You know, uh, is their own way to refer to what we will later on define as the third world. Okay, now we don't use those terms anymore because we understood now that this first, second, or third world, or fourth world, that category that do not work. Because if you go to some places in, in Detroit, you will see people living in conditions that are within the first world. You know, so those categories we don't use anymore because we understand that it may be that somebody from uh, Mexico have way more relationships with people or the relations that, that are built in terms of class. Let's say somebody who is studying at the University of Michigan or in Harvard or in Stanford. He has more in he or she has more in common with his class than with other Mexicans who had just crossed the border without education. You know, so we understand that those categories are way more complicated. But here uh, he is referring, and uh, we start seeing this kind of a notion between civilization, development as children, you know, and this preference for colors. So what we see in a very simplistic way is this kind of notion of the other and these, and these people or nations who are in a state of nature and civilized children, not fully defined humans yet. And then by contrast, the self as somebody who is in opposition with that, somebody who is modernized, civilized, therefore an adult with a full reason. So we start seeing how in one of the first books on theory of color, we start seeing something that had not to do with color itself as a, as a chromatic, but it had to do with our own values that we associate with color. Therefore, it creates this notion of a Western, but in this case, a Western who is very much North Central European experience versus the no Western, but very much also about the Mediterranean European experience and the rest of the world, okay? Now, there is other things that we need to contemplate here. The context of the reform and the concept of a, of a, a study and the re rejections of, uh, of uh, ornaments and the perception, for example, during the reforms, that excess of decorations, imagery of the saints, and the, you know, it was perceived as idolatry. So, in many ways, this austerity that we are that is very much based on religion is trans is is carry on into the way that we understand our state. Okay. So there is this emphasis, for example, of this notion of uh, the virtuous or be simple or the sobriety or, or take control. So one of the things that the reform does is this notion that by personal merit, by hard work, including the contain and the control of emotions, you know, in, 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 for example, in this case, in aesthetics, the person uh, so, uh, go through the process of some kind of uh, refining in their own personal relation with God, you know, so there's some ascetism that is carried on into the aesthetics, okay? So uh, we will see that one, for example, in the German uh, architecture um, and how it defines our relation with modernity. So one of the uh, book that I like a lot that deal with this kind of, uh, this kind of um, development is uh, by Michael Tessin, who is an, uh, a cultural anthropologist from uh, New York. He said, his book is called Sacred Color. And he said, Western fantasies about no Western people are fantasies that aesthetically divide the world into chromophones and chromophiles. 
color for the West became attached to color people and their equivalent. Now, not just the individual, okay? Not just Latin America and Asia and Africa and everything that is not Europe, but it's also the things that people do, okay? So we, we make jokes sometimes when they say, uh, when I, for example, when I sit, people imagine a, a, a William Calvo, okay? That is go beyond how did I dress or how did I decorate my house, but it's based on their own personal notions of how race has been constructed, in this case, through my language, okay? So, uh, so it's not just, as we understood race, it's not just about your phenotype, but it's about the language, the intonation, the accent that the individual has, okay? The objects that people utilize. Now, that carry on into this kind of modernity that I will call this kind of colonial approach to color. And the notion of conquering the other, not just by having control of the possessions of the individual, the land, but also the color and the production of color in this community. And how to civilize these individuals on how, what kind of color they use and they prefer. Okay, so Tausin said, the polluting and transgressing quality of bright color, when he defined this kind of chromophobia as this fear of the West by to color. Now, later on, you will say, but William, come on. We also have in the West some artists and some designers who have used a lot of color. But we need to understand that this use of extravagant color has been perceived as extraordinary and out of the norm. Okay, so even that relation that we have that creates these categories of some artists to be extraordinary because they have used a lot of color, it bring light into how do we have connect this kind of epistemologies of taste, you know? Or how do we define good taste? For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, when a student go into design uh, in my school, uh, at least in Arizona State, uh, the first year they take general classes, uh, design history uh, or design 101. Uh, our program go for architecture, urban planning, uh, graphic design, uh, industrial design, etc. So the first year is everybody taking common, and then at the end of the first year, they need to apply for up what we call upper division, you know? and it's based in a portfolio. Now, the portfolio is a very interesting concept because we sit there to revise this material to see if the person has it. Now, what is it? Nobody really knows what is it. You know, they say, well, the sensibility for design, the taste for design. Well, what is it? It's based, for example, in the, the materials that they have built together, for example, in, this in the first year, year and a half in the department. But the interesting thing is that it's as easy of somebody to take their material pay somebody to do the graphic design or the portfolio. So even those things who may be not as good, they look extraordinary just by the quality of the design. So we start seeing that means money can be translated in higher possibilities to get accepted, okay? So it's not really about it because sometimes we don't even know what it that means. And many artists and many designers never get in design school because they were perceived and they didn't have it. So when we talk about it in design, in architecture, in urban planning, you know, especially at the beginning of the career, we really are talking about this kind of unspoke epistemologies of how do we understand taste, okay? So it's important to understand, therefore, the taste, very much linked to design, have, have allowed the design have been used as a tool for civilizing as much as a tool to improve people's quality of life. It's true, we're trying to design better buildings, we're trying to design better spaces, better tools, better uh, things for people. But in reality, a lot of the discourse under design is this notion of civilize the individual. So I, I always bring, for example, this kind of a fantasy that we have in America, 
you know, uh, this is a famous uh, film, but it's, but it's not just one film. It, it's, it's part of this kind of genre of film about, for example, a, a two rich men, most of the time it's two male, because it's uh, this notion of how wealth is constructed and hold in the nation. And another person, in this case, is a woman, but at some time it may be a homeless man, okay? That these two men make a bid and they say, I can guarantee you that in a month, I can turn this uncivilized homeless individual into a person of society that you will be uncapable to recognize. And that's how the joke of the film uh, works all the time. You know, the person make all these mistakes, cultural and social mistakes. Uh, but at the end of the film, because the person has been exposed to good design and to good things, the person became a human. Okay, so this follow, you know, my third day, Larry is one of those cases, but more modernly, we have pretty women. That is also merged with all notions of uh, the exploitation of the women body, the notions of what, how civilized. So at one moment, by the end of the film, Julia Roberts have been completely transformed into a civilized person that includes also that control of how did she use color and shape. Okay, and now you may say, well, it's not as simple as that. But we will see some of the advertising that we use today to see how this thing is continually perpetrated today. Not just that the way that she became an object of desire by other male, the center of the gaze of the male, but also by controlling emotion in terms of how color is used. So use become a, a, a tool for, a, for manifest the individual. You know, so there is a moment in the film when she decides to wear a red dress. So why red it is perceived you as an as a identifier of desire, okay? So therefore we need to talk about desire, the dominant by color, but actually the dominant by the accent and the control of color preference and color desire in society and in particular in the design field. Okay, so this is how, for example, and I just use one of the many styles that we have, the international style who has become in many ways, in art is the Renaissance, but in design for, for a long time, it has been this kind of international style as this kind of the top of good design, okay? But it's, it's not just about design and the control of, of, of the productions or the type of, of aesthetics, you know? But it's also about what kind of color I use. So we go into a period and we always say in design that it's like a pendulum. You know, we go into a period, we stream color at 30, and then we will move. By the time that modernity and international design became at the top, we move into the postmodernity. But the postmodernity, we read postmodernity through the use of color and shape as a that period of excess. Okay. And even then, later on, we react again with this kind of post postmodern style, you know, that we see so much, for example, in the, in the uh, Apple design products that we have. And we move back into this kind of uh, controlling color, having only white or only black became a synonym of sophistication. So even during the period that we uh, became fascinated with color during in, in postmodernity, it still carry on this kind of notion that is extraordinary, is different, is revolutionary because we live an emotion moving wild because of relation with color. So color, as Tassin said, is what sold and continues to sell, to sell modernity in the world. So I say civilization is a design project. Behind the clothing that we design, the street, the, the architecture, the, even the interior, the interior design and the graphic design that we have in the web. It is all part of this master project of civilization and color and the control of color and the use of color are central for our relation with this. When we, for example, I teach a class on cars and there is a huge section about car design because you know, we're in Detroit. I mean, we're here in, in Michigan. Uh, one of the things that I say to my students, when we, when America sell a car, when we start selling cars outside the United States, we don't sell just a car. You sell 
the car and the, co and the dependency in, in gas, but also road and how the, the cities need to be designed. And also we sell them uh, the, the signage system in, in order that people can recognize uh, how to drive. So you don't sell a car, you sell a system. So design, it have very much invested in a project that is a project about selling, producing, and constructing civilization. But a civilization who is very unique because it's based on whose civilization? Those who own the means of, of production in this case. That is very much carried through Europe, United States, and then later on, as in 1975, we have the, the China and Japan who get into, for example, in the car industry, but it's very much carry on the selling premises of the West. Now, continuing, say, Gloria said, say, Western, and this is a, a, a quotation from her book, say, modern Western painters have borrowed, copied, or otherwise extrapolate the art of tribal cultures and cool, and, uh, and told cubism, surrealism, and symbolism. You know, this is a piece from Paul Guibain. Uh, and it is a very interesting because even Vincent van Gogh and Guggen go into this kind of a, uh, project of mastering the combination of colors created somewhere outside. So it's very interesting because even today, sometimes, you know, I'm, 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 I'm walking a few weeks ago with a friend of mine uh, in Detroit, we're going through um, uh, a Mexican restaurant that is, you know, people eating their food and brunch. And the guy said, you know, and they, they have music. And these guys say, you know, Latino music, Latino, they have culture. We don't have culture in the United States. And I say, what do you mean you don't have culture? The well, we don't have the music that you guys have. And I go, well, what about jazz? What about blues? What about all rock and roll who are many much, they're very much expression of the American experience? And he said, no, no, but you know what? And then he go into all this rampant imaginary of how, I don't know, he imagined the Latinos we live in this kind of permanent uh, musical when as soon as you hear salsa, people start dancing. But, but what he's really talking about is how do we imagine culture as an outside experience? Therefore, you need to travel to Latin America. You need to travel to the, uh, to the Pacific Islands for the Western in order to get color, as if they didn't have color themselves. Now, what they're trying to master is not just color, but it's something else. So he say the West can, you know, and this is from uh, a, a, a beautiful book uh, uh, about uh, decolonial methodology. And he say, the West can decide, extract, and claim ownership of our ways of knowing our imagery, the things we create and produce. He say, and then simultaneously reject the people who have created, developed, and develop those ideas and seek to deny them for the opportunity to be creators of their own cultural own niche. So we have before a picture, and this is Linda T. Hamilton Smith uh, from her book, The Colonizing Methodology. Now, in the slide before this one, we have a, a, a picture, one of that uh, picture from uh, Paul Dugan, uh, of this kind of a representation of the Pacific Island. Now, this is the other picture of him engaging in uh, this kind of uh, relationship with Native women who are underage. Uh, and we go into a completely different relation of power and control and how it became very much about a project of colonization, not just of the color and the aesthetics of a community, but also how the West see these communities, but also the bodies and the death of these communities. So we cannot disassociate the cultural production and our relation with color with this kind of community that it has been putting uh, in vulnerability in the first place. So one of the things that I wanted, and I said, well, William, you know what, but that was a long time ago. You know, that's not how we do, this is not how we teach. We are sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, in, in my school in design in Arizona. He said, well, we don't do those things no more. So one of the things that I did was to look at some of the books that we used during the first year of teaching design, especially to do to design, and see what did they say? This is the textbook that we use for our students. 
So this is a book for the 2000 period edition was in 2000 and say, uh, for 10, uh, uh, 10 years from uh, Hudson and say, the rarest, most precious color have been imported from exotic places. Okay, this is from the book, Colors, the Stories of Dyes and Pigments. So you will see it's still this kind of notion that color exists only outside the way, outside us. And they exist and is inhabited by exotic places and exotic people. Therefore, we understand the other now as in terms of in design as kitsch, as vernacular, as folk, or art and craft. This notion that we have in design uh, of this, this idea of fine art versus art and craft is very much based in this description about class and race. So in fine art, we find dance or ballet, uh, opera, uh, classic music, et cetera, et cetera. And you all know, because we all have been brought by this kind of notion of what is fine art. But in the other category, we have art and craft, the things who are kids, the things who are folk, the things that are vernacular. Now, one of the ways that we differentiate between these two cultural productions, and this is very important because this is at the core of how do we understand art and art production and how do we validate in the way what is good and what is a good taste and what is not. So in the art and craft, you know, we have something that is naive, that is inferior, is peripheral, but more important in design, one of the categories that we use for them is the idea that the productions of fine art was constantly produced. Somebody went and sit and decide, follow a methodology that this is what they're gonna produce, okay? So when we think about Beethoven um, and all these other productions, we don't think of, of, of this, of this uh, classic music as culture. I mean, we think about high culture, high brown, but we don't think of them as a very particular cultural production or a particular place and region and time. Because we think about fine art as universal. So one of the great uh, uh, ways of how taste work in this kind of notion or differentiation epistemologically is by creating these categories that art and craft were producing, were producing not because people follow methodology, but because people follow their own instinct. An indigenous person produced this beautiful basket without know. They just sit and they just create. So we, this notion that these communities did not follow a methodology, who was conscious, is part of how race, and racism is perpetrated in the way that we construct and talk about design today, okay? So this is important thing. So think about epistemology only in reference to the achievement of the Western world, you know? So let's, this is how Nelson and Maldonado Torres talk about this kind of uh, cohesive, co cohesive over, overreaching epistemic project of the West. But we can think in the same way about design, in the way that we use the West cultural production as the point of reference and the points of departure to understand other cultural production. So what is, the first, what is one of the things that we do in design? We teach people about our nouveau, our deco, the renaissance, you know, as, as the center of the, of the way of how aesthetics have been produced, but not, not just that, not because we want to understand a European production. No, we, we taught them as the norm of how they need to use this aesthetic, a point of reference to understand every other production have been produced afterwards. And if somebody want to study African American art or African art or Pacific Islanders, they need to take a what? An elective. So racism is at the core of how do we in design, in architecture, 
have construed our curriculum in the way that if somebody want to study the other, they need to take classes outside. Furthermore, a lot of times when people put it together, the curriculum, they think about the other as the lecture that is happening at the end of the class. So you go through all the, Amer to the European experience, and then you will have one class about this. You know, the same thing happened, for example, when we think about women designers. We introduce women as if they were one, one week, okay? But not as a constitutive part of the design process all the time, okay? So here's the question for us in design. If we wanna really talk about race and ethnicity, and we wanna talk about equality and an egalitarian world, we need to start thinking about how do we have put together those syllabi and the curriculum for the formation of designers. Okay, so this is central and, 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 and to, to move forward. Otherwise, we will have these lectures as an extraordinary thing that happened here and there as an elective, but not as a part of reevaluate how do we how do we understand what is good, what is good taste in design. Okay. Another book. It say this is um, a Jane for 2004, Color in Three-Dimensional Design. You see? And this is where that, how things about design it start to become way more refined. This kind of racism and classism became way more refined. Say, an individual with less life experience or lower financial means, mean poor, may find few huge attractive that the individual with greater means more education, higher intelligence, and broader life experience. Now we have moved here to a different discussion of design. Now it's not just that a person uh, is from this community or this other community or that they have bad taste. No, we have moved way beyond that one to say that it's very much tied to the class of the individual. So just by the class, we make assumption that the person have a better uh, taste for color. He said he may find fewer huge attractive. I mean, it became way more defined. It's because they have higher education and even worse, they are way more intelligent than other person. So by the color that the person prefer, you know, we can start making assumptions about the intelligence of the individual. Now this is pure classism. Okay, and because we understand that class is tied to race in terms of access for communities to move, to, move for, to move up in class. So then we start seeing how behind the discourses is really much about an issue of race and class tied together, but also about intelligence. Remember that famous case of a Harvard faculty who was claiming that uh, Latinos were less smart than other people? Well, in design, we continue that discourse by saying that people with less life experience, well, what about if the person never traveled? Now, outside the community, are they inherited less capable for, for good taste? Now, we understand that exposure to life experience change our experience, change our relation with aesthetics. But it's not something inherited or the individual as a constitutive of who they are. And all, again, and all, advanced, more advanced to say, the more advanced one is in terms of socioeconomic development, the more one is dragged to complex color. More complex color requires more narrative. More successful individuals are more likely to choose darker bodies. I don't think you, we need, I need to explain this quote because the notion here is very clear. Is that the most, the most high you are in your, in your means, the class, the more likely is the individual to understand complexity of color. Okay? So then what happened when we see a picture like this one, who is a cultural production of mural in Chicano Park in San Diego? Now, it's not just design books. 
and the way that we teach design and color theory to our people, but it's also the way that we refer to places. Uh, if you do, if you want to do research about these things, uh, you know, this kind of uh, guide, uh, travel guides are fantastic means to understand how we, the West, have imagined other places. Uh, so this is one of those uh, guides called Best Places on Southern California. Okay, so let's see what they say about color when they refer about California. As you travel through South, South, through Southwest California, notice the exaggerated sense of color to be found in Hispanic neighborhood. Hear the soft cadence of Spanish spoke in the street. Smell the accents of Latino American cooking, a marvel of the witty decorated lowrider car on the road beside you. Now, what is these people are really doing? It's selling this notion of the Latino neighbor that is very much look like, a, I don't know, American high school musical. Uh, they imagine that we, what, what are we doing? But is this interesting here? Because as we follow in the previous uh, section of this quote, there is this notion that now color is not only related to race, but also the language of the individual, the, and the cooking that the person and the object that they use. Okay. So we, we start seeing how this kind of notion or construction of the other, and in this case, Latinos, but it's the same thing if we talk about African Americans, is constructed in the West. So this is a, 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 a particular most current case. Uh, it has to do with uh, America at one point at the beginning of the 2000s, discover Latinos. Ricky Martin became a thing. Jennifer Lopez became a thing. And suddenly one day, United States wake up and say, and thought, oh my God, there is Latinos here. Even though the oldest sections of the modern time, uh, as we understand the nation, are in Florida and in Texas and in territories who were part of the Spanish uh, territory. You know, in the Trio of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico lost almost 51% of its territories on, for the United States. So Latinos are an intrinsic part of what it means to be an American, because from the beginning, we were part of this kind of this territory that we call now America. However, in one of these special editions, the Times decided to do this kind of uh, uh, expose of the present of Latinos. And one of the sections is about design and how uh, Latinos are changing design. So in, the, in this page that you see here in front, they have different uh, manifestations of designers. Uh, in, one, in one side, they have Carolina Herrera. And in the other, they have Ophelia Montejano. Now, look at how Carolina Herrera is presented in an all white dress. It's almost the same type of dress that pretty woman was wearing. Uh, it is all about this kind of stoic in control of the colors. In this case, Carolina Herrera is presented as this kind of a Latina, you know, who is totally in control as a modern, you know, sophisticated, civilized design. And in the other, we have this uh, Mexican American designer from California, Ophelia, that is presented, look at that, with a chihuahua, with maracas, with a matador dresses, piñatas, paper flower, colonial style, and this kind of a carnival going on around them. Now, most Latinas designers that I know do not walk around in this kind of setting. Now, what is happening here? It is this constant representation of Latinos and this kind of dichotomy. Now, it's not that Carolina Herrera is less Latina than Ophelia Montejano, but in the but in their in the imaginary of the nation, be a Latino means, you know, to embrace this kind of aesthetic. Okay, the more that and you you find it very much every time that you go to a Mexican restaurant who is not for Mexican or for Latino uh, uh, consumers, but it's more for the uh, Anglo consumer. 
you will have a lot of extravagant colors and decoration. That is not something that you necessarily find in Mexico. Why? Because they are selling a product. And the product is tied with the pressing of the maracas and the flowers and the things. Okay, so uh, to give you an example here. In 1990s, Sandra Cisnero painted her home in the King William neighborhood, a pre-Columbia purple. Here, uh, preservation, uh, preservation officials deemed the color, and, and especially was the homeowner association or the neighbor, the color is totally incorrect and unsuitable for the Victorian neighborhood, and he wanted it to change. So they, she was fine, and she was asked to paint the color in something that was less bright, because it just did not match the color of the neighbor. And Mrs. Cisneros, who is one of the most famous Latina writers in the United States, say, well, it depends on whose history you are talking about. This is San Antonio, not San Anthony. Sandra Cisnero won the battle in the court and was permitted to keep her lavender color house intact. And this is some of the, of the things that she said during the court case. The issue is bigger than my house. The issue is about historical inclusion. I want to paint my house a traditional color. And this is the sophistication of this of this, uh, of this scholar, because she started using the same terminology that it was used against her. The idea was that those colors do not fit the historic of the, read, of, the, of, the, of the neighbor, that it was not historical. And she said, you know, I thought I had painted my house a historical color. Purple is historic to us, to Latinos in that region. It's only go back, let's say, you know, thousand years or so to the pyramid, you know? is present in the Nahua codices, book of the Aztec. As a turquoise, the color I use to my house trim, the former color signified royalty, that letter water and rain. So she started making a case. The argument of the homeowner association was that the color do not fit historic uh, standards. And she said, actually, it go back to a history before uh, this community was put together. So that's how they, and one of the amazing things that she did is that for the court case, she brought a lot of scholars to talk about color and design. And it became a, court, a famous court case to uh, argue against this homeowner association, uh, understanding this was the sovereignty of the homeowner association, okay? And homeowner association is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, we understand that homeowner association became particularly important in the Southwest after the Rodney King riots, because in California, and especially in LA, the city is well segregated based on race and class. And the notion was that people do not cross those boundaries in normal circumstances. During the riots, people cross those boundaries. And one of the things that happened is right after that was the emerge of homeowner association as a way to not just control the aesthetic of the home, but also regular who is the people who are in and out. So we can understand homeless, and there is a beautiful book called um, Architecture of Fear, who do a huge uh, study about homeowner association within the context of race and racial exclusion in the Southwest and the rest of the nation. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, research was in lowriders. And one of the questions that I uh, posed to many of the lowriders artists uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, there is a misspell here, an artist. There's a T here. He said, I asked them if they use, if they was, how do they feel about this notion that Latinos use one particular type of color? And one of the artists said, and on Friday I will talk uh, on the workshop a lot about lowriders. Um, I say, I never, I want to say, and his name is Ruben Reyes, who is one of the most famous Latino uh, lowrider artists that we have in the nation. He said, I never heard that Latino prefer center color scheme. I disagree that, that because the diversity of color in lowrider, because there is a wide diversity within the way we feel, see, think, or do within the Chicano community. It's implied that we are monolithic, you know, using just one particular scheme of color, that we only think in one way. We take cars and we convert it in, in something that is ours. We have our own imagination. 
why should we limit ourselves by saying that it's only be red or only pink or only one this particular color? So but for them, and this is a very interesting, it look like, at least for this kind of library artist, is that any color can become a Latino color. And if you study Latino art and art history, you understand that we have a huge diversity of color that is used. Now, why the question for us is, why this emphasis in understanding Latinos only by bright colors or bright design? Now, I'm then trying to deny that there is part of our community to use those colors. And, and it's a beautiful thing, okay, that you need to celebrate and you need to be protect and you need to be uh, promoted. It does what the individual wants, but it should not come as an imposition on how be a Latino need to be presented, they need, how a Latino need to be presented or be understood. So we're moving a little bit into the conclusion and say, well, this tyranny that we understand before in aesthetic theory rests on some premises. One, the notion of a linear aesthetic evolution. Why that? Even the way that we think about design is come with this kind of notion that we have the Renaissance and then we have this and then we have that one. So in that way, that by now, by the time that we get to modernity, we have evolving. As if anybody who do not follow the same linear evolution is out of the norm or worse, have rejected evolution. This linear understanding of design aesthetic as an evolutionary thing is particular uh, uh, toxic for communities who are not part of the West. Because one is perceived then as an outsider, but worse, is validate the notion that we need to educate them. We need to help them to become more human, more civilized, just as the myth that we have with pretty women and all the things. The idea that they were not completely human until they are exposed to good design. Okay? Then also, the myth that exists some kind of unified aesthetic state of self. That the nation or design as a field can exist only if we are committed to one particular aesthetic or style. Okay? When in reality, what we're talking about is an ethnocentric aesthetic state based on a particular uh, experience or a particular community that is not, do not open to the experience of many others. So in reality, we are talking about the rights of the individual to express themselves and to manifest themselves in the aesthetics that best suit their own history and their own community. And any aesthetic and any culture should be valued and be protected as anybody else. So I'm not talking here that one is better than the other. I'm talking about that there is a multiplicity of styles and aesthetics that they need to be uh, 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 protected. Okay? And for more, the refusal, refusal of design and design aesthetics to recognize contradictions and ambiguity. For example, in this case, what is happening with somebody grew up between multiple cultures? What happened with you are by ratio, by culture? Why the person needs to choose one or the other in terms of, 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 their, of their reality aesthetic? So one of the big questions for design is how Capitalism has created this notion of design for consumption approach. And how even the, our discourse about the production of aesthetics are very much tied with this notion of supremacy or particular group of others. And um, even more, and this one, something that we still work, is this kind of centrality that is given to this kind of male genius in design. Okay? That it has been so um toxic not just for women but for those who do not conform for what is perceived as the center of design in tango chicanos and latinos you know color intervention follow a different chromatic trajectory than the one that we have understand through western or eurocentric ideas that cannot be explained with traditional eurocentric aesthetic models 
that they have intrinsically constructed to promote disparity. Okay, so this is a picture from a, a, mar a, a marketplace by my mom in Phoenix, South Phoenix. Um, it's called Rancho Grande, and this is just the aesthetics that they have. Now, for architects or designers, they will say, well, that's kind of postmodern. Now, it's not, I say, it's not postmodern. It can be in terms of the use of the graphics and the aesthetics and the shapes and that, you know, that we know about, that we talk about, that. but it's not in the sense that do not follow the same trajectory of how it has been created. So it's important for us to do not impose this kind of ways to think when we think about the production of design in other places. Give me a second. I have a pet and this one is really crazy because he was doing noise. So a great challenge, we say, is to invent, and this is uh, Guillermo uh, Gomez Peña who argue, uh, talking of a, a border uh, um, artist, and he say, a great challenge is to invent a new language capable to articulate our incredible circumstances. So what we see here, for example, in the US-Mexico border and the Latino community is the construction of a completely new language. And it's not, I'm not, I mean, if you want to use the metaphor of be bilingual, so think about bilingualism in terms of aesthetics. So the question for our designer is what is really happening outside the center? That's something that we need to start thinking about it. I mean, in, bi in biology, they say that it is within this threshold of the mile into the land and the mile into the ocean where most of life happens in, in biology. So there is something that is happening outside the center. But design focusing only in the experience of the center, we are missing a, a huge possibilities for new design and new production a new solution for problems that people have in design, in architecture, in graphic design. So they say, he said, our art, our art, he say, function both as a collective memory as an alternative chronicle, okay? So just to finish, he said that we think about color, we need to really decolonize or rethink in a different way, okay? wants to think in color as an archive of people's memory, as part of a larger epistemology of how people know about themselves and the world around them. You know, the color is very much tied to people experience and place. The color is not randomly selected, but it follow order. They follow a, 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 a methodology that makes us feel better, okay? So when we think about, um, you know, one of the things that we say America, in America is that the rise of freedom or the sovereignty. So what about we start thinking about color and aesthetic as a human right of the individual? So the sovereignty of each culture to manifest their self to the aesthetic that they feel that, they feel that is better suit themselves, okay? So um, again, I think I end with Gloria and Saldua in this kind of say, to say that color is very much tied to the experience of how we think about knowledge and how we think about the world and how do we see ourselves. So the best uh, uh, desire for me is that once you leave this, this lecture, you go and take risks. Explore different colors. Do not be afraid or explore new things. And I guarantee you, as soon as you do something who is too bright, somebody will say to you, oh my God, this is just so bright. What happened? Because we are sometimes too tight, you know, too civilized about what color means. So uh, I hope that it works for us as we see color are intrinsically connected to our biases about race and class in America, and especially in the field of design. So uh, I open now, hopefully if we have any questions. If not, I wanna invite as much people as possible for come to my workshop on, on Friday. In this lecture, on that lecture, I will talk a little bit more 
about particular case studies within the Latino community. Uh, low riders will be one of those, especially on how we uh, understand cars in or customization cars in the context of uh, America um, and, and, and other many other productions in design. And then we will talk hopefully also about the Virgin of Guadalupe as this kind of transgressing transformation of the image as a this kind of not just decolonial but also as a feminist reconstruction of a religious imagery. Um, that is so important for the Mexican American community in the United States. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to see if we have any space for questions. Uh, I'm sorry that I was very fast uh, for some people, but I hope that it ignites some kind of questioning. And if you disagree, that's a good thing because design needs disagreement. Okay. William, can you see the QA tab and see questions? As yes. Great. Students and anybody else that's out there in the audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Olivia. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that our design students take risk with color. You know, now we understand that color change, variations in color, biological variations had to do with weather. I mean, the, in the in the in the tropical you in the tropical regions we will have more color than in our Michigan you know, uh, winter. And so it's also biological because we represent what we are familiar with, okay? Any questions? I don't know if how does it work. Oh, we have here. Ryan okay. has a great question for you. Okay, Ryan, uh, what do you think about the application of empathy in a human-centered design methodology? So we all have cognitive bias. How will we may be able to emphasize with people outside of in group? Can you point us in the direction of a material that is capable of tracking color, class, and other issues discussed today? Ryan, what an amazing and fantastic question. I need to say something to you. I'm part of an international group of people that uh, is called Social One. It's a group of uh, people in the humanities and social science, uh, and that has been a central question for us. Uh, empathy, care, and love uh, have become that most essential question for today. Seriously, if we love and care each other, the world will be a completely different place. So for one of the things that this group has created during the pandemic is a, it's an international group. We have faculty from all over the world, including grad students. And I will, if you send me an email, I can, I can uh, help you to join. Uh, we meet every other month to discuss these things. And the question that we have just last Friday was about methodology. And the question is, can love and care change the way that we do research? And we say yes. Because look at that. Love and care is a very crazy thing. Love and care make you and I do things that we don't do normally. Because if you love and care somebody, you go be, what we say in English, you, do, you walk the extra mile. So in design, for example, uh, recognizing the social impact of design as a, as a value to evaluate this is something that is just relatively recent. The Golden Compass, you know, or the International Association of Design, only into the 2000s give the first award for design for social change, you know, and it was given to a designer who helped, who helped design a mobile uh, stove for indigenous communities moving from one place. That was into the 2006, so late, that only then we start recognizing in social care as a one of the categories for, for, for good design. So yes, because this, this in very simple words, if we use love and care as a point of departure, you put yourself at to the service of other people. So therefore, you design not for the exploitation of the community, but to help the community to be a better place. You see yourself also in, as a part of a network. When you may be here in the United States, and the other person in some other place, but we are interconnected because we care for this community in the other place. So definitely, love and care is, is, is a central, um, not just, it changes the way that you relate with the people that you do research, uh, how do you connect with the production of this community? You see that community as somebody who are giving to you uh, something, but then you have also something to give to them. So love and care means that we care for in all directions, in both directions. And if we move into a place where they care as much as you care for them, 
we have a place where you don't, the person do not need to be, for example, I say, you don't need to become brown or Latino, you know? And I don't need to become white because I love your culture and you love my culture and we can become something different. Now, but that requires a huge transformation when we both recognize also the privilege and how I can get to the place that I am today. One of the hardest things for people and for all of us is to recognize how meritocracy work in the United States, including in design. design one, of the, I mean, one of the documents that people are going to read for Friday is about a, a little overview of how design is so racially and class divide. But just look around. How many African Americans we have in the field of design? Now, it's, it's, it's minimal. Now, it's not just because we don't know how to bring the design field or because they don't have time. No, it's because design by itself is extremely expensive. I mean, I don't know how you remember, but for me, every pencil, every brush, that type of paper, I mean, that everything. It is almost like a, when you go to a medical field, it's full of so many different specialized tools. So access is not just about bringing the individual or the student to the design school, but it's also create conditions for the person to remain and also to, talk, to create conditions that is say, your experience, even if you don't see it yet in design, is valid and important. Now, one of the problems that we have in design and design history is the notion that, for example, they say, okay, we were missing Asian American design. And then somebody go and write a book about Asian American design in the United States. Fantastic. It's needed. It's important. But that's not enough. Because if we remain at that level, it still perpetrates the notion that the system that created that oppression or that community in the first place is still good. And that by creating a space between the books and putting the book right there in between, now it's a result. No, the issue in design is not only to create new books is to understand how the library has been created in the first place. That thing in design only in terms of this kind of salo. The American experience is an experience of diversity and exclusion. And we need to understand design also in those terms. So just, of course, build, write the book. But it's also a question about how aesthetic and design and good taste have been putting in place from the beginning in the way that is seen as exceptional when in reality it's part of everyday experience. Very simple, very simple. A book on women in design. It is amazing, but it's also if we don't question how sexism is at the center of design, the problem cannot be resolved. Because we resolve one community, but there is many others who have nothing. So but me for me at least with this lecture today, it's about the systematic way the race system works in design, but it can be applied to gender and class and other things. So care and love is for me the next step for design, you know? Oh, we have more questions. Hey, Ryan, thank you. Send me an email and I will connect you with this community. It's fantastic. Kim, this is one from, uh, you are going to seem to be highlighting the way in which aesthetic is political. But my question will be, are all aesthetic political? Ah, okay. That's a very interesting question because now the first question for me is how do we define aesthetic? Now, women of color say everything is political because their existence is political. Because in a system that did not want women, you know, for women, everything is political because a system that did not want women to be fully represented, their existence is a really an act of political transformation. Now, in aesthetic, I will, I say, yes. Now, why? Because politics is really about, politics is about plurality. The word politics is, is mean about interrelation with other people. And aesthetic is really about interrelation with others. If about me with other people, but me with that environment, for example. So for me, everything is political because why some aesthetics are not represented. 
why some studies that only see as exceptional? Why I need to be forced to learn this aesthetic and I build it? Now, I, I need to make something clear. I don't try to say, well, do not study uh, the Renaissance or do not study Art Nouveau or Art Deco. Of, of course, let's study those. But in the way that we understand it, in the cultural and historical context of where it's come from, not as something that is more exceptional than other styles, but it's part of uh, these telescopes, mosaics, or many different other expressions. Okay? Now, the Industrial Revolution created a particular circumstance for a particular type of design to be manifested. But what is that? Okay? So for me, for me, all aesthetics are political because all aesthetics come from somebody and somebody is also in relation with other people, okay? Now, the question is how do we learn those aesthetics? And who decides what aesthetics are valid for you to learn and other don't? Okay, I think a few times were passed when you left for a few seconds. Would we see those slides? I don't know which slide they're talking about. When, when, I, when I move to see my, to the dog, there's something, did I move something? Oh, I didn't know that. What is the name of your group? Did you say group one? No, it's called social one. Check social one and is that uh, same here. So let me see if I can open the slide and see what I did. Um, let's see, let's open this thing as a thing and show, wait. Share, share, stop at the share window is closed. Oh, wow. Let's see. William, I think uh -huh. the slides were- We ran out of time. Yeah, no, you're um, back. It was back here where you first introduced Gomez Pena. Yeah. This one's here? A little bit further back, I think. This one here. Oh, yes. Oh, you didn't see this one. OK, perfect. Of course, let's share this one. Uh, sorry for those people who didn't know. Now, sorry, <laughs> I didn't notice that one. Uh, one of the things that happened, uh, I feel like uh, one of the amazing things about the COVID is that suddenly people walk into our faces that are very less a little out of control and having a new pop is one of those things, you know, a, pop, a COVID pop. Is. So sorry for the, for the, for the problem. Here. Well, one of the things that is important, we will talk a little bit more about this one. And maybe when we put in the presentation, we can cut and put it in the right place here. Uh, there is this kind of concept about the border. Um, we will talk a little bit more in Friday. Uh, one of the contributions of Latino aesthetics is the no this notion of raspachismo, or border aesthetic and border knowledge. Um, and for this one, I use the notion of Américo Paredes, who is an anthropologist. And, and he says something very interesting, is that many of the cultural productions of the border, they just not happen to be just random, but they come to exist as an expression of the knowledges of this community, very much tied in some ways of this trajectory that we have, for example, by feminists, when we talk about a standpoint theory, that based on the experience of these women of color, they had developed a unique relationship with knowledge based on their experience had allowed them to resolve their, lo their everyday problems in a very unique way. So if we understand some of the cultural productions of these communities along the border or the or, 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 or marginal community, we start to see them more than just something that just happened. Okay, but it's come into what Gaspar de Alba called the militant practice or the everyday experience of these people, you know? So when we talk about the border or the US border, you know, or La Frontera, we talk about this kind of new cultural production that emerged there. Now, when I say the US-Mexico border or La Frontera, it's not just the US-Mexico border as the South, because if you go to Mexican town in Detroit, you are crossing the border. If you go to a uh, home depot and you see the people uh, waiting for a job, you cross a border. So the border is not just the physical political border between two nations, but it's also the borders who are created. You know, I, I, I don't have here a map, but if you see the map of racial division between Detroit, you can see a mile is not just part of the imaginary, and then the, the line has moved. But there is a spaces where you can see, based on the, two, the last census of 2010, we can see how race has divided 
and how the freeways have been used to separate the, 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 region, the, the race, uh, racial groups in the United States. When I was doing a presentation a uh, few months ago before uh, the, the racial tensions emerge again with the Freud case, but we were saying already, this is a bomb really to explode that we need to deal with. Because, so what I say, raci the racial border is not the US-Mexico border, it's anywhere where these kind of div divisions happen. You know, say, Gloria, so they'll say, my people did not split the artist from the functional, the sacred from the secular, art for every day. The religious, social, and aesthetic purpose of art were all inter interwined. Now, what it means to say is that, and this is something about longer discussion, is that this kind of, div even this distinction that we have sometimes in the West of an artist as somebody who does something different just for pleasure of the art or the aesthetic. And then we put in a different category of functionality. Okay, so that's why, for example, in art and craft, we can say, oh, this base is only, the only function is to carry water. Therefore, it's not hard, uh, hard uh, fine art. Even that category is, 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 is under core, this kind of discourses that we have about utility and how people will, who have less means, you know, I, I put it in a disadvantage that many of the cultural production they generate are not perceived as art because it's just a base to carry water. But if the base was never used for water and it was put in a museum, suddenly it became important. So in design, one of the categories that we need to reevaluate is this kind of sense of the distinction between art and aesthetic as a fine, you know, just for the muse of the soul and functionality. At least in industrial design, uh, we, we move far away from this kind of thing, you know? And then, you know, this is part of this kind of discussion that I would say that they, how it was crucial for them to create a different language careful to articulate what is happening. And this rearticulation is happening with the low writer, but it's also with the mural, but it's happening with the music, and new things are constantly recreated. So even those categories that we have about folklore is very much tied with racial undertone that we need to completely disregard. Now, many Chicano and many Latinos have said, well, if you call it folklore, and this is the way that you will not uh, try to possess them, so oh, that's fine. Okay. But then the question, for example, have emerged on representation, who have access to that object, what objects are uh, uh, put in the museum, and what does that mean with an object in the museum? There is a famous case, and I want to finish it because I know they're running out of time. Uh, it was a group called ASCO. ASCO was a, a, a group of artists, young artists from East LA, uh, and at one point they want to have their pieces uh, show in the um, LA um, Museum, modern museum. But the museum and the current museum say, I'm sorry, we don't, when they went, they said, we don't have Mexican art here, Mexican American art. So they went, this is in the late 1960s, like 19, yeah. And they, they go and they tag the museum outside, oh no, actually 1980. They go and tag the museum, and then they went in the, during the night, and they went in the morning, and they went to the museum and they say, now you have Mexican art. Now, of course, it was a direct attack to the, to the construction of what it can be valid or what is perceived as good. Now, by now, ASCO is totally recognized as a valid art production and they have, have many of his members, uh, the, the art have been uh, exhibited at the museum. But just to say how race and class have been very much tied in the way that we represent um, and see and kind of, kind of create categories about design. Yeah, and I think so after that one, you guys get uh, cut up, cut up. That's correct? Okay, don't say that, I, oh, I have more questions. Uh, so social one is the name. Um, I, sorry, I'm silent because I'm reading the question.
Okay, so what, what are your thoughts on color a perceived threat based only on the color of one skin in relation to design? Well, I think one of the norm, one of the things that I was saying is that the argument is that skin color and the perception of color is something that we are very much tied to uh, to the I just need to say PS up. It's very much it's very much defined by how do we understand and construct relations of class on, on race. So what is interesting here, and I think for us, is how do we have learned to read race in other people? Okay. How do we understand that this person it is black or white? Now things get way more complicated because when they understand is that race and understanding of race is socially constructed. What does that mean? What it means is that, it, that the racial body is a social body. It's not just about how do you perceive itself, but it's all the other notions. So for example, there is a very famous case that we study in one of my classes during the, the Colombia time in Mexico. This woman uh, in Mexico, um, they have this kind of book for white or poor race, uh, Spanish, and they were the old one for mestizos or mixed race people. Now there was a case with this one, and then based on where you were uh, registered, that will define the, the type of job that you can have, the place of the city, et cetera, et cetera. So basically Spain has a long tradition of uh, racial segregation as well as England. In this case, with different trajectory based on a caste system because of the history of uh, occupation from, 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 uh, for many, many years of Muslim community. So the, uh, Spain have a different relation about race, uh, interrelationship. Now, anyhow, the case was very interesting because she was registered as a mixed race person. So her husband wanna contest the registration. So he go to the court, of course, at that time, the colonial time, uh, contesting, uh, a registry mean go to the court, but it was going to the church. So because the church, Catholic church at the time were as both at the state and money, you know. And it's interesting case because the individual, uh, the woman cannot, even though the case was about her race, she was never allowed to go to the court because only women of by reputation will go to the court. So what the court did is that they interview everybody else by her. They interview uh their um the person who who is one of the uh housekeeper or one of the people who work in the kitchen to ask them what kind of food does she eat oh she don't eat tortillas she eat bread therefore she's white oh, okay then when i interviewed the priest well she 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 do things but the things that she does are the things that the spanish people do not like indigenous people so it's a very interesting case because it proved, even so early as the colonial times, and it's carrying to today, how we read people, race, not just by the skin color, they never saw the person, but by the other social construct. So the body that the person has, the racial body, is a social body who is perceived in relationship with others. So the clothes that you wear and how society has perceived those clothes to a particular group, you know, define how the people read. So for example, there is a huge distinction between me uh, when I speak or, or when I silent. Me before I have a mustache or when I have a mustache. Because in America, a mustache is, that type of mustache is also racially constructed. If I have a blazer or if I have a guayabera. So police read those codes as well. We read the object that people have. I mean, when I was doing research on low riders, people will go and say, oh, that car. I mean, remember, I say, oh, that car is a Mexican. I say, well, how do you know? Oh, because of this or that. Because it's not just about the phenotype of the person. It's the language and the object that we have. So of course, there is a direct relation between our construction of race and how prejudice is constructed and how we use aesthetics to read people, OK? Are aesthetic ever separate from what you have learned? Learning a skill. Is learning always attacked to politics? Yes. I mean, I say yes. Because, okay, learning is directly tied to knowledge. 
you learn something. I mean, knowledge, epistemology is about what do we know and how do we know what you know, okay? So at one point, somebody decides, you, your teacher, you, eh, that this is what you should learn and not this. Okay, now, why is politics? Now, what is interesting here is that people are using politics, but that, that what we really, what, the, the, what is interesting here is that that use of the word politics, as if anything else, as if politics is only about racial tensions about people. Politics is about everything. I mean, uh, you with your partner, you engage in a, po in a politics or negotiation. You and your teacher, you engage in a politics of where do you sit in your classroom? Who would you get more attention between other people? So what is interesting here for me is that I would say, yes, epistemology, knowledge, and why we learn is always political because it's always about particular type of people, okay? So I want to say that we cannot disassociate one thing for the other. Now, but politics is not always about bad things. Politics is about people, interrelationships. That relations can be healthy too. So you can also have good, healthy politic relationship between human beings. So in the way that you can learn the aesthetics of the other community, why? You want to learn about, you know, when you fall in love with somebody, uh, with a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a partner, you engage and you spend time with the individual because you want to know what the person likes and what they don't like. You engage in know more about them because you want to have a politics a interrelation with the individual who is positive and healthy. So you, of course, you can learn about, and you we should learn as much as possible as many different aesthetics models. Why? Because we also want to learn to be sensitive. You know, the Me Too movement is about ending uh, sexual uh, violence and misogyny, okay? But part of the project is to help people to understand how to be sensitive about the issue. So we understand that that joke or that comment or that move is not appropriate anymore, okay? And we engage in be better people, better society by learning from each other. So that's why I say we are moving forward a better society despite the difficulties and the pain that we're going through, you know, like a, it's looked like we, you know, people say like, but we are more, in, there is more violence, racial tension now than before. Is that true? There was a lot of violence and racial tension before. I mean, people was lynched and hanged from trees. We, if I was a Latino, I would not be allowed to drink for that or go into that pool. So there were violence. Okay. But what is happening is that we are becoming way more sensitive. Now, the road is hard because change is always hard because we are, we like what we are familiar with. In design also, we would engage in a process of reevaluation of how do we have put together our curriculum. And that is good. We will make mistakes, but we will improve from those mistakes, okay? We need to definitely engage in a more diversified group of faculty and students and staff people. But we also need to engage that recognizing that dialogue and diversity is complicated too and help each other to move forward in this kind of engagement. And we will need to engage in design in a process of unlearn. You know, many of the ways that we have understand design and aesthetics. For example, when we talk about good design, people say, well, they need to have this and this, and there is all these lines of things that people need to follow. One of them is environmental impact. Now, of course, the good design cares for the environment because it's our responsibility, okay? But it may be that a person who buys this cheap plastic uh, chair who is a copy of an Inns or, a, or a Le Corbusier chair, it's not that they don't have good taste or that they don't want to engage in the environment and caring for the environment. It's that they don't have the means. So design needs to engage also in a broader project 
of equality and access to resources for everybody. Okay? Because this is the project we in design exist in order to build a better world. And that's what we want to do. Seeing Mark me is over. I need to go. But <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. And I with you in this plan together to be a better world together in design and outside design. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, William. And I thank look forward you. to seeing you on Friday. Uh -huh. Yes, please, everybody, come. We will talk a lot about writers and the region of Guadalupe, graphics and things. Take care, OK? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. OK.